So welcome to Richard Florida's talk on Who's Your City? Uh, how the creative economy is making where to live the most important decision of your life. Uh, Richard is a professor at the University of T Toronto, um, and he first exploded onto the scene in 2002 with his book, the, R the Rise of the Creative Class, which according to his press release is a pioneering <laughs> look <laughs> of how a, new social, a new social class of creative people it's was great. emerging at the forefront of the 21st century economy and provided a refreshing new way to think about how we live today. Um, Richard's new book, Who's Your City, is a book that I think will resonate with all of us, many of us who made a conscious decision not to be living in a certain suburb of uh, San Francisco. Damn, you stole my opening line. <laughs> <laughs> it's a book about how, uh, while technology maybe makes the world seem boundless and flat, it really isn't that flat, and where we live does matter. And I'm, so, I'm going to leave you in Richard's hands Thank with you. that. Thank you. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so yeah, that was the question I wanted to start with. Um, and I thought about it a lot this morning. You know, why here? Why not that suburb outside of San Francisco where we're really excited to go next week? But why here, why here for you guys? So I want, I want you to think about it. Why here for you guys and, and why here for Google? because it wouldn't be what most people who study what I study would have expected. They would have expected everything to be in this cluster out on the West Coast. So I want you to think about it. The other thing is, you know, I'll talk for 40 minutes or so, you know, maybe 45, leave plenty of times for questions. I, I've been a professor at Carnegie Mellon. I've been a visiting professor at thank you, <laughs> MIT. I teach at the University of Toronto. I like questions, and I like really hard questions. So you don't have to feel, I know you don't, because you work here, and I know where you went to school. so. But you, you don't have to feel shy. And you know, none of us has the last word. And that's something I want to say. And I think you know that because you work, most of you, in technology. If anyone thinks they have the last word, they don't. And all of this is evolving. So, and all of my ideas are constantly evolving. And I've always found my best ideas, or whatever I've added at, at the margin to ideas, have come out of dialogue and from great criticism. So please, you should feel free. And I look at this. And the other thing is, if you have any cool ideas of what to do with this stuff, like in your own work and how to make it come alive visually or with maps, you know, I'm easy to find. I'm, I'm Florida at creativeclass.com. I am completely addicted. You know, I live online. If anyone ever has ideas about that stuff, feel free. We have a pretty cool institute at the U of T, and we're building it out, and, and, and we're, we're in this for the long haul. Um, and then the, the, the other thing by way of starting I want to say is kind of, when you mentioned the press release and the bio material, really the book that I wrote, two books before this, Rise of the Creative Class, was really about the kind of lives that you guys are leading and have been leading. So in some ways, I learned a lot about this from just interacting with folks, in particular my students and graduate students at Carnegie Mellon and other universities and now at the U of T. Anyway, I've been, I went to Rutgers in the mid-70s and I took a degree in political science and urban studies. I went to Columbia and I got a PhD in urban planning in 1986. So that's between two and three decades of studying kind of place and geography and location. And after writing like lots of academic papers and running a research center, and, and I can talk about how my wife Rana, who's traveled with me today, who helped runs our little company, um, we moved to Washington DC and we liked it there. And then we got the offer to come to Toronto and we moved again like two times in the past five years. And also we talked to a lot of people, family members, friends who were moving. And I kind of realized, and then, and, then, and then I read Dan Gilbert's book, Stumbling on Happiness. And he said, you know, we make three big decisions in our life. What we do for a living, who we take as a life partner, and where we live. And I know there's like a lot of economics and business and guidance counseling and advice columns and Business Week kind of magazines on what kind of job and career and, and how you would do that and how to navigate it. And certainly my dad growing up in New Jersey, and I, I talk about my dad in the beginning of the book. You know, my dad worked in a factory. He had an eighth grade education. He like, you have to study really hard. You have to go to college. You have to get a good career. And first they wanted me to be a dentist. And then they wanted me to be a lawyer. And I just didn't want to do that. So, but then my mom always, and then other people, you know, if you think about this who question, people say, well, you know, who you marry, 
is really important. That's imp I watched the Today Show this morning, and they talked about like happiness in your life and how your family and the person you spend your life with is so important, and people who are married and have happy marriages are happy and more satisfied in their life. And I thought my mom always said, Rich, you know, even though your dad only had an eighth grade education, I guess I could have you know, gone out with someone more successful, but it was the best decision I made because I really was madly in love with your dad. And then I thought about our own moves, and no one ever told me. And, and even in my field, now 20 years into this field, people write about why location's important and how place affects things and uh, why companies locate in certain areas. They don't really write so much about why we locate. But I thought, you know, no one has ever really put down on paper how this who question, they talk about the what, they, uh, they talk about the who, how this where question, how this where question, how our location affects our lives. And then I met with my research group, and we tossed the idea around. And this young guy who worked for me, he's now, he just got back, his band just got back from South by Southwest. They're called These United States. They're really, really interesting. He left kind of writing and researching to play, to have this band. He's a good songwriter. He said, why don't you call it Who's Your City? And we all laughed. And then we took it around to publishers like Basic Books, and they said, you can't title it that. You have to title it like the location factor or the wealth of place or why place matters. And, we, and I don't have a big, you know, at creativeclass.com, our website, we have people who come and communicate with us. And it's not a huge thing, but it's big enough. And we had a little vote. And people were like, no, absolutely, who, Who's Your City is a better title because it resonates with people. So once we got that far, I decided to write it up. And, and in the few minutes we have, you know, and, and really, it's the result. It, it, it tries to be easy to read, but it's the result of tw 20 or more years of kind of research in this field. But the first thing that, that we found that's really, really interesting is that, well, you were talking about this, technology, the internet, computing, transportation advances. Everybody immediately hears of that stuff and they think, oh, that's going to make place less important. That all of this advance in technology and communication and transportation is going to make the place you live less important because you can live anywhere. And, and, you know, that's not just a new story. That's an old story. Hey, guys, there are chairs up here if you want them. You don't have to take them. I mean, I'm not trying to make you sit up here. This isn't a bad class. It makes you sit up front. Um, it's okay. And, and, and so, and so, you, and this is an old story. Like I was saying, if you go back and read the history, like the telegraph was going to do this, and then the telephone was going to do it, and then the streetcar was going to do it, and then the automobile was going to do it, and then certainly the airplane was going to do it, and then the fax machine was going to do it. And, and so what we did, because we're pretty empirically minded, Oh, there's one chair left, but you can stay back there if you want. Because <laughs> um, 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 we're pretty empirically minded, we said, well, let's take a look at this. So the first thing we did is just look at data. And what's really interesting is there's very little data, which is cool for you guys at Google, too. Most data that's collected is collected at the national level. Now, a country may have data, like the United States or Canada or Australia or Euro Europe. Eurostat may have data on like cities and provinces and the state, but nobody collects actual information on cities. So the first thing we did, there's a program at the United Nations which collects data on population of cities. So we looked at that data, and the first thing that struck us is that in this past year, for the first time in human history, more than 50% of all people live in what they call urban agglomerations. So more than half of the world's population is urban. And if anything, that's been growing over the past, you know, all human history, but certainly over the past 50 to 100 years, that percentage has been growing. And that's when it got interesting. The next thing we had to do was try to estimate, because population is a crude measure of concentration, right? There can be concentrations of people like New York or San Francisco that are relatively wealthy or produce a lot of economic output. There can be concentrations of people in the emerging economies where people are living in essentially slum or kind of global slum situations. So we said, let's try to figure out how much economic activity goes on in these cities. So I'm not a computer scientist, but lots of people I work with are, including two or three of my best research collaborators who are computer science undergraduates and then took economics uh, PhDs. And one guy said, who was at the University of Maryland, he said, well, Rich, you know, there's satellite maps of the world. 
And I said, yeah, they're really cool. He said, you know, we could use them to distill economic energy. So he did this. I don't know the methodology, but he basically built some algorithms that would allow him to distill from these energy maps economic output. There's another group, Bill Nordhaus. He's a famous, famous economist at Yale. He's done something similar, not with light maps, but he did this some, some, something similar. He called it his G-Econ program. We calibrated against his work. We also went to every country that has subnational data. So if, a, if the United States had information on the gross regional product of its 300 regions, we looked at that. Or if Europe had the same thing. We got the best calibration we could, and then we estimated this for every kind of you know, kilometer of light across the globe. And then we got innovation data. Now, we would have liked to have had better innovation data, or we'd like to have entrepreneurship startup data. But that doesn't exist, but data on patents do exist. So we took the US data, we got them to do a special run, break it down by zip code. But they do the zip code of every inventor in the world. So not just inventors in the United States, but every inventor that files a US patent in the world, they have his or her location. And then we combine that with data on international patenting from the World International Patent Office. And then finally, finally, we got data on scientific discovery. This guy, Mike Batty, he's a professor in, in London. He had been looking at bibliometric data. I'll bet you have better bibliometric data. But nonetheless, he had bibliometric data. And we looked at scientific discovery and publication. Well, what happened is, you know, you all know Tom Friedman's work about the world being flat and how he says the world is going to be flat. It's going to be a level playing field. There are 6 billion people competing for work. He talks in that book, if you want to innovate, you no longer have to emigrate. The world wasn't flat at all. You know, whether we looked at population or economic activity, innovation or discovery, it was actually, it was like this. Population had a line like this. Economic activity had a line like this. Innovation had a line like this. Each of those lines got steeper and steeper. So what we talk about in the book, and you can see the maps in there, is that the world is really, really spiky. And, and I, I know you guys can understand this, but lots of people have trouble with it. It's not like it's actually one or the other. It's both flat and spiky, decentralizing and centralizing at the same time. So as the world gets bigger and as more countries come into play, and as economic activity expands and firms decentralize their economic activity, they don't do that in a ubiquitous way. They do it in a very concentrated way. So there's kind of a dialectic. As the world expands and grows more global, the vehicle of globalization are these very spiky places. And then we went one step further. We decided that using this data series, we could actually capture where really important clusters of economic activity are. We could not only capture a city like New York, but we had the satellite images. We could identify the world economy's real economic centers, which aren't necessarily cities and aren't necessarily states and provinces and certainly aren't nations. But by using that satellite imagery, we could see where there is a actually observable empirical concentration of economic activity. Well, we did that exercise. We gave all of them kind of funny names. You know, we tried to give them interesting names. A fellow named Jean Gottman in the 50s, he's an economic geographer, described the emergence of what he called megalopolis, right? It's a word we all know. But him, him megalopolis was Baugh's Wash, he called it. The Boston, New York, Washington corridor. Well, that one popped up right away. And then there was another one he called Shy Pits that ran from Chicago to Detroit to Cleveland to Pittsburgh. But he didn't do much more. And a few other people had tried to look at US meg, what we call mega regions. We actually identified every single regional cluster in the world, setting a threshold of a place that produces more than $100 billion in economic activity. We actually identified that there are about 40 of these things worldwide. So there's 191 nations. But actually, there's 40 mega regions, which are the real centers of the economic action in the world economy. They house less than 20% of the world's population. They account for two-thirds of all the world's economic output. And almost more, I was going to say almost 90%, about 80 to 85% of the world's innovation. The world is a very concentrated place. And, and the other thing that struck us, and I see that you guys are a very global group, if you look at the United States, you actually get a very biased picture of the geographic distribution of economic activity. 
Because the United States is the most evenly distributed place on the planet. Like, it has the most number of kind of interesting cities. You know, New York and Boston and Washington and Chicago and Austin and Ann Arbor and Pittsburgh and uh, lot, San Francisco and LA, Seattle, Portland has lots and lots of cities. Not that they're all the same. They're diverging increasingly over time. But they're more or less similar. We looked at India and China. And, you know, people say the United States is involved in this competition with India and China. I could talk ad nauseum about that and how silly those arguments sometimes are, you know. But the United States isn't competing with India and China. They're two of the most spiky places on the planet. In China, almost all of the economic activity is clustered around Shanghai and Beijing and a few other places that radiate from out from there. And in India, it's Bangalore to kind of Mumbai and then Delhi. They are much spikier. And I remember meeting with one of my students. We've sin since written two kind of interesting papers on China using these data. But my Chinese student said to me, Rich, he said, he actually called me Professor Florida. I'm like, no, 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 please call me Rich. And he called me Professor Florida. He said, you know, I don't want to be insulting. I don't want to be too aggressive. But he said, in Shanghai, I live better than you. But the people at the outskirts of Shanghai live, his words, and I quote him in the book, in pre-civilized conditions. So what, what we got a sense of is that the world is not only economically uneven, it is incredibly spatially uneven. And that economic activity, as it spreads itself, is actually doing so in a way that, that concentrates this activity. Which leads me to kind of the first academic point or kind of intellectual point. Why would this be so? Why would, why would this happen, right? So we have an empirical observation, but then you have to sit back and go, whoa, hold on. I thought costs were supposed to matter. I thought companies were supposed to migrate where there was lower cost. I thought you guys were supposed to all look for places where you could optimize your utility and find that dream home, you know, that was affordable, not living in a place where you spend two, three, four, five thousand bucks a month for rent and live in 500, 600, 700 square feet, right? It makes no sense. It makes no sense. So then there is a woman who I actually got to know before she passed away. And I'd encourage all of you, if you haven't, to read about her, because she was truly remarkable. Um, she, didn't, she went to the University of Scranton. She didn't get a PhD. Her name was Jane Jacobs. She wrote a fabulous book on this neighborhood in 1961. She wrote a book on, little bit, on her Hudson Street in Greenwich Village. It's the most remarkable book on cities because she talked about what really makes a city work and, and how urban renewal, these big urban renewal projects, were killing cities. And you can see their legacy, not only in New York, but everywhere. She actually fought the urban renewers. They were going to put a, a highway right through the Greenwich Village, two highways. She fought them in one. But she wrote a, several other books. I got to know her late in her 80s. She became a mentor and a kind of idol to my, me. She's now become rediscovered by, by many interesting people. But she wrote a book called The Economy of Cities and a book called the Wealth, Cities and the Wealth of Nations. She really, in those books, and I'm going to write her death, the anniversary of death is in April. I'm going to write a piece, a 750-word piece about this and just put it down on paper. But she solved this puzzle. And, and now economists and, and social scientists are catching up. And, and there's a great economist, Robert Lucas. He won the Nobel Prize. And, and he, he, he said, he, had, he asked a question in, in the address after he won the Nobel Prize. He said, and he, he lived in Chicago. He's at the University of Chicago. He said, why would people continue to live in downtown Chicago and in Chicago and pay so much rent? You, New York would even be more, or London, a more obvious example. He said, well, people could say it's because it's a fun place to live or because it has good restaurants or good shopping centers. But that would be a theory of restaurants and shopping, not a theory of cities. And here's what Jane Jacobs discovered. Economic growth doesn't come from capital investment. Economic growth doesn't come from ports. Economic growth doesn't come from factories. Well, you know this. Look, we're at Google. The real source of economic growth comes from people. It's such a novel idea, and it makes so much intuitive sense. But think of it. Economic growth doesn't come from where the company locates. It doesn't come from big physical investment. It doesn't come from built steel factories or auto factories. It comes from people who have ideas. And she said, what's so interesting about this is when people come together in a city or a community and live near one another, they don't just increase their productivity two times. It becomes self-reinforcing. And, and actually, 
she actually leveled this very implicit critique at Adam Smith. Because Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations said, economic growth comes specialization and the division of labor. If you can break things down into more and more specific tasks, whether that's in a shop or in a factory, you can get economy of scale and a division of labor and you'll be efficient. Jane Jacobs said, nope. That's a theory of growth, but it's not a theory of innovation. Because all specialization really allows you to do is do something slightly more efficiently. If you want to understand where real economic development comes from, you have to understand these massive waves of innovation. That comes from people and people in cities. She didn't have Google to call upon her Apple. She actually studied the woman who invented the bra. It's a hyster I don't want to tell you the story, but it's a hysterical story about how this lady invented the brassiere in, in New York City. But basically what she said is that cities not only make each one of us more productive, because we're diverse and because we have different perspectives. And she said this in a very matter-of-fact way. Later, a young man named Scott Page, who's a brilliant economist at the University of Michigan, proved this. If you have cognitive diversity, if you have cognitive thinking styles that differ, you get much better group problem solving. And what Scott proved is that cognitive diversity is associated with ethnic, racial, age, gender, and sexual orientation diversity. So Jane gives us this basic theory which says it's not cost that's driving economic development, it's really the productivity advantages that come from locating in cities. There's one, there's two pieces of that book you guys might be particularly interested in. One is I did with my collaborator Rob Axel, who's a brilliant computer modeler, adaptive agent modeler. He actually built models and, and I could get you a link. We have some video, in fact, Rana, we should, you know, we should put this up on our website at creativeclass.com and whosyourcity.com, but we actually have little videos he built simulations of how cities form around this Jane Jacobs principle that talented and creative people, when they come together, they optimize and they magnify each other's productivity. And we did this over millions and millions of runs, iterations, and what you see is these giant mega regions forming. And it's not like they, they lock in, it's a continual dynamic process. So you see these little locations starting to build and then one gets really big and it stays really big and then two or three get big and then they crash and you get other ones. The other piece of research I think you guys would find fascinating is by the folks at the Santa Fe Institute. Would actually use some of our data and some other data to quantify what they call urban metabolism. And, and I, this project is just mind blowing and we're gonna spend some time together this summer. But basically they said most species have metabolic rates and those metabolic rates are constant across species. Cities have metabolic rates that are faster. And they said in order for cities to survive as they grow back, they have to super scale. And so that work is talked about in the book, and I think you'd find it really interesting. But the point is, cities are, these, cities are what we call mega regions, are these incredible economic and social organisms that work not because they're fun and they're great places to hang out, but because they make people more innovative and productive. So that's the first part of the book. The second part of the book says, well, how does this affect kind of your economic life? Two things really struck me in doing, three things really struck me in doing this research. The first one I called initially the difference between the mobile and the stuck. I now call it the difference between the mobile, the rooted, and the stuck. Increasingly in, in our society, economic advantage comes from, for, to people who are geographically mobile. And, and that's something I want just everybody to be aware of. I know most of us in this room are aware of it but most people in society are not aware of it. It used to be that you can live in your hometown and find a job in a factory in an office building and be around your family and friends and do just fine. Increasingly what we found and drawing on a lot of other research is economic mobility is strongly associated with geographic mobility. So not everybody moves. <laughs> Lots of people choose to stay rooted. They want to be around family and friends. They don't want to disrupt their community. They find that they get a lot of joy from that. And then tragically there are the people who are stuck who don't have the resources to move, who own homes in older cities and in places that those homes are underwater, as they say. They can't sell them. And, and one of the things that the book points out is that mobility is, is very highly, geographic mobility is increasingly associated with socioeconomic mobility. The second thing it finds, and related to that, and in technology fields you see it, is that job markets are becoming incredibly specialized. Does that make sense to you guys that job markets, most cities used to have a wide array of, in mega regions, a wide array of employment opportunities. 
now increasingly, if you want to do a certain kind of thing, you have to be in a certain number of cities. Well, think about the valley and high technology. That's self-evident. Think about LA in entertainment and filmmaking. The one example I, I talked about in the book, and especially since my wife Ron is from Detroit, and we spend a lot of time there, and we, I kind of like Detroit, and I lived in Pittsburgh, I like Pittsburgh. The example I use in this book is why would Jack White move from Detroit, this in, Jack White of the White Stripes, this incredibly rich and thriving rock and roll root scene where he kind of invents the White Stripes. Why would he move from there to Nashville? And he did. He sold his house in Detroit and he moved to Nashville. And the question I asked myself, I said, okay, I understand why technology people would locate around a Stanford or wherever MIT, you know. I understand all of that, and that makes all good sense. And the university is a hub of activity. We're good friends with the RIM guys, Ball Silly, and why they'd be around Waterloo. Musicians could live anywhere, right? I, I mean, musicians don't have to concentrate and collect themselves together. If anything, you would think musicians would be around big markets where they could get gigs. In fact, we looked at the numbers over 40 years. Musicians are more highly locationally concentrated than techies. And, and Nashville is extraordinary in that almost all of the gain in the concentration of musicians comes from Nashville. And we see this in, and there's a cute little map in there that we drew up, of the different kinds of regions in the United States where different kinds of professions concentrate, for all the reasons James Jacobs mentioned and I talked about before. But the point of fact is if you're thinking about a career, you, you have to be really, really, really thoughtful about this. And as a young guy, Will Wilkinson, he writes a fantastic blog on happiness, really smart guy. He, re he reviewed an, an, an early copy of this, and I quoted him. He said, you know, so you want to be an actor and you don't want to live in New York or L.A., suck it up and resign yourself to dinner theater in Biloxi. <laughs> and realize that your whole career prospects are going to change. So, and the final thing on the economic dimension that I think it's worth mentioning, especially now when we talk about expensive housing in New York City and kind of the housing crisis in America. Housing is the single mo biggest investment most of us make, most people make. And there's a great professor at Wharton, a good friend, Joe Giorco. He actually looked at rates of housing appreciation for American cities over the past 40 years. And he showed quite clearly, that he called them the superstars, that there are 10 places over those 40 years that have consistently appreciated at a level that leaves the rest, you know. If you bought a house in Cincinnati, this is his example, in 1960, you, you probably paid about as much as the one in, in San Francisco. The one in Cincinnati would have doubled in value. The one in San Francisco would have went up 10 or 20 or 30 times. So, so the point that the book makes and it's, it's kind of, a, and again, a very simple point, but people don't think about it. When you're thinking about buying a house, affordability is only one side of the equation. So you can afford to buy a house in one of the non-superstar markets. It seems like a good choice. But in fact, the investment in housing isn't about what's the cheapest. It's about what offers the largest rate of return, and then think about that for the choice of location as a whole. It's not just about the trade-off between what's the most afford, and think about your own location choice. It's not just the choice of the place that seems most affordable. It's the choice of the place that affords the, the greatest appreciation, well, in your, in your housing, but also in your career. And, and, and people need to think a lot harder about that when making this choice of where to live. Well, the next part of the book veers from economics into new territory for me, and I think new territory for my field. I want to qualify that. Because one reviewer of the book said, Florida overlooks, he, he thinks he knows something new about psychology, but he doesn't. Environmental psychologists have always known the effect of place. And they said, as a professor, he should know better. Well, well I do know better, I actually, and I wrote my psychological colleagues a, com, a note. Uh, the, the literature on, on environmental psychology is, is wonderful, and if you know it, it's about, you know, do, how do the tree canopy, in, and I'm trying to, how does the tree canopy in a neighborhood make you feel? If there are park benches, is that good? If the space is isolated and doesn't have a lot of people, do you feel less disconnected? It doesn't talk about the relationship between psychology and place and actually personality. That literature is very slim. So we did two projects. The first project was by happenstance. 
Um, I had been interested in how place affects psychology for a while. I had learned in my earlier research, when I had done interviewing, and people had said to me, why did you choose the place you choose to live? Well, they said, because I wanted to be in a place that has excitement, that has stimulation, that has energy, was, was the concept. And I actually gave a talk to the Positive Psychology Conference, and I asked about this construct of, I talked about this construct of energy, and afterwards, a group of positive psychologists said, no, 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 that's not silly. That's actually really important. Let's talk about it. Well, they had begun to collect some data, and I got included into this. One day I saw online on a fellow's blog that there had been a study done by Sam Gosling at the University of Texas and Jason Renfro at Cambridge University of how they could tell your personality by the music you listen to. They don't need to give you a personality assessment. They just go look at your CD collection or your iPod or your iTunes. They can tell exactly what your personality type is. And then they started studying dorm rooms, right? Duh. Exactly by how your dorm room looked, they could like read with per almost perfect accuracy your personality type. And then, of course, they started to mope around offices. And think, I mean, it makes perfect sense. So I wrote these guys a note. Jason writes me a note right back. He's a young guy, just graduated the University of Texas, now a professor at Cambridge University. He's like, I read your book, Rise of the Creative Class. It was really great. That's why I moved to New York City after I graduated. It was like, da -da. he said, you know, I started to collect this data. He had data on 650,000 personalities. So he said, let's map it. So that's all in the book. And, and we mapped it. And, and I had to go through this incredible learning experience. There's five personality types psychological personality types. There's conscientious people. They work really hard. They're very dutiful. There's agreeable people. They like to get along with other people. They don't fight a lot. They're not very aggressive. Um, there's extroverts, right? People who like other people, want to be around other people, get stimulation from other people. They tend to do really well in like sales jobs. There's neurotic people. New York is filled with them, by the way. <laughs> it really is. That's not just the fun. It really is. And, and, and also places even like, like Pittsburgh and Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's just really interesting. And then there's this group they call Open to Experience. Um, many people who would work in your kind of business and certainly be innovative and entrepreneurial would fit this Open to Experience category. It, the research on creativity suggests the Open to Experience personality is highly creative. The people who are entrepreneurial tend to be highly creative. They also tend to be more introverted. Most highly Open to Experience people, because Open to Experience people tend to get stimulation from their work rather than from other, they're kind of different from an extrovert. An extrovert gets stimulated by other people. An open to experience person gets stimulated by experiences. They tend to be somewhat disagreeable. They tend to be somewhat aloof. <laughs> no, I, I taught at Carnegie Mellon. I was a visiting professor at MIT. I understand. So no, but, but it's just an amazing thing. And then we map them. And I think we actually use some of your mapping stuff, some of your heat map stuff. We, we, and we'd love to do more of this. And we got to do more, because this is a first pass. We map them. And, and I, I feel so bad when, when I say this, because everybody, the conscientious people were like a blo blob. The agreeable people were like a blob. The extroverts were like a blob. In, and then the open to experience people were like pinpoints. They were in New York. They were in Boston. They were in Washington. A few in southern Florida. Austin, Texas. Bing! And then San Francisco and L.A. And up in Seattle. And, and Jason and I looked at this. And we're now probing it in even more detail. And I speculate on this in the book. Most economists and social scientists have, have looked at what's happening in our country and said what's driving economic growth are people with high levels of education. And they're becoming uh, divergent. Their locations are diverging. It used to be every city had 12 or 15 percent of people with a college degree. Detroit, Pittsburgh, New York, San Francisco, and it might have been a little higher in New York and Boston and San Francisco. Now San Francisco and Washington, D.C. have over 50 percent, and a place like Detroit has 14 percent. So human capital, they say, our education is becoming divergent. And, and all I said in this is, what if education is only one part of skill? And then I thought about all the people who started interesting high-tech companies and how many of them were college dropouts, right? I mean, you know the list better than I. How many of these people were college dropouts? And then I thought about the fact that, according to other research, 30 to 50 percent of all startups in the United States today are founded by someone who came from a foreign country. So I said to myself, and no one had ever looked at it, what if this open to experience type of person is not only the innovative, creative, entrepreneurial, what if they're the migraine? And so what the book suggests is that there's another way of looking at this propulsive dynamic of innovation that is not just skill-based, 
and, and I want to say this very gently, because my experience at Carnegie Mellon was probably the, the best of my life, but I pose in the question the difference between Pittsburgh and high technology in the Valley. And I, and I suggest gently that it's not the fact that Carnegie Mellon, in fact, in terms of per faculty productivity, it is equally as productive as Stanford or MIT. I suggest that what might be different is not just the sunshine, that actually there may be more of these open to experience types of personalities who've clustered themselves around the, the San Francisco Bay Area, historically for a lot of reasons. It was open to new ideas, it was open to new people, it, maybe it had sun and fun, it had great writers there. And I'm not saying these pe all of us went open to people, found, you know, kind of search, oh, I want to find another open to experience person, I've got to find one. They kind of just ended up. And you know where else they ended up? I mean, we're sitting in the middle of one of the largest concentrations of open to experience people. And one of the things my work has been controversial about is, is and I'm doing, I hope to write my next book on music, but, but one of the things my work has suggested for a long time is if you want to think about incubation of technology and innovation, one of the things you could do is track the location patterns of artists and musicians, and we called it the bohemian factor. It got a lot of controversy. But one of the things that this work points out is that these bo bohemian clusters, these artistic clusters, are not just artists you know, strumming guitars and being in the folk bars in the village and before Bob Dylan and playing jazz and you know, experimental beatnik lifestyles. But these were places that somehow found it possible, that open to experience people found it possible to congregate. And then all of a sudden, they just became magnets over time, unwittingly, for these kinds of populations. And we did one other thing with psychological data. We partnered with the Gallup organization. We did a survey of 28,000 Americans. And we asked people two kinds of questions. What in your life makes you happy? And, 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 you know, is it the what you do? Is it the who you marry? Is it the where you live? We were the first people who were systematically asked about where. And then we said, with regard to the place you live, what are the factors that really affect your subjective well-being and your psychology? The first thing we found in a nutshell, and then I, I want to wrap up. Um, the first thing we found in a nutshell is that, that three factors really determine your overall life happiness. Um, it's not money, you know, although there's a threshold. There's a threshold effect. It's not money. You need a satisfactory income. Below that satisfactory income in developing and emerging nations, you can be ter terribly unhappy and dissatisfied. But there's a threshold, and it's not a whole lot of money. 20, 30,000, 40,000 bucks. Over it, you get dimin diminishing returns. What makes you really happy is having a job that you love and you're challenged by and that allows you to manage your time. I mean, you guys all know about that. Secondly, what makes you really happy in your life is your social connections your relationships. And one of the very, very devastating things we found looking at some sociological research is that few, we have fewer and fewer real social connections in our life. In fact, the modal number of people we are close for, close with, close confidants in America is one. I mean, that is really ob abjectly terrifying. So, 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 so but, but people who have a richer social life, they feel more socially connected, and I think it's something many people are striving for. A uh, young man, Ethan Waters, wrote a great book on this. He called it The, the Urban Tribe. And he talked about how, in, 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 it's particularly among younger groups, people are actually forging new kinds of communities, very different than communities in the past, alternatives to coupling and to marriage. And, and it gets a wonderful book. But anyway, we found those two things are really important, what you do and, and how excited you are by it, and, and, then, and then kind of your, your social life. Um, we also have an interesting map in the book. We call it the Singles Map which shows kind of the places with the best ratios for men and women, which is hysterical. Trust me, that's what gets the most hits on the website, what gets the most dialogue going. New York is much better for guys than girls, by the way. Just have to let you know that. The West Coast is just the opposite, which is so interesting to me. But then, then we looked at the effect of place. Place really has a huge effect on people's well-being, and it's interesting. It's not only about equal to the other two, and the, the board talks about the statistics. They're, not, they're, they're close to one another. What's really interesting, when we ask people where stress comes from in their lives, um, their job could be a source of great stress, and even their family could be a source of great stress. Around 3% of people reported that the place they live was ever a real source of stress. Now, that is very different in places where commuting patterns are horrific. It, people who have long commutes are terribly unhappy about that. But on, on balance, on balance, where we live tends to act on the positive side of our well-being ledger. But the question we asked about why was really fascinating. And 
I had gotten embroiled in debate with other urbanists, including some in New York at the Manhattan Institute. And, and what they had argued is that all of my work on, on the bohemian factor, we actually had a gay index, which showed that places that have higher gay and lesbian concentrations have higher rates of innovation and entrepreneurship. And, and they kind of said, this is fluffy, this is frivolous. You know, does Florida really believe that places that have street guitarists and people wear ripped t-shirts and want to live in the urban core, that somehow, you know, that's going to outcompete the great suburb? So I said, fine, fine, fine. You guys are, and, and you know, I took that seriously. I didn't dismiss it. They also said I had a gay agenda. These are just hysterical things. <laughs> they accused me of trying to undermine Judeo-Christian civilization. I mean, this is just wild. But like, okay, let's look into it. I'm an empiricist. I don't have a values agenda. And, and so we did this survey with Gallup, and we asked about 100 questions about what people want from their community. We surveyed every ethnic group, every racial group, sexual orientation, income groups, age groups. And what we found is that there are five factors that really are important. The first one is, is most people, given their druthers, would like to live in a place that's safe and have good schools. Very important. Second thing we found is most people would like to live in a place that has economic and social opportunity. Third thing we found is if you have a good mayor and good business leadership, people are happier. But those were just three fundamentals. At the margin, there were two things that really elevated people's happiness with their community. We asked a question. We said, how open, good is your community as a place for uh, racial minorities, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, artists, techies, entrepreneurs, family with children, poor people, elderly people, disabled people, gays and lesbians, young college graduates looking for work, singles. What was interesting is the places where people reported that their town was a good place across the board, everybody's happiness factor and well-being went up. Guess which group people said, on balance, was the group that Americans were least likely to be open to? And we didn't ask atheists, <laughs> dang! <laughs> Young, recent college graduates searching for a job. And, and we can talk about that in the, in the question. Second, the, the second th that factor we found that is the single most important factor, the second most important factor we found, the first most important, the most important factor we found was we called it quality of place. The physical characteristics of the place itself. We asked, you know, do you, have, do you have parks that you can use? Do you have open space? Are there trails? Is there architecture that you admire? Are, do you like the rivers? All of this stuff about the aesthetic character, we call it quality of place. You know, the kind of strength of the place itself. Places where people report that they found the quality of the place to be high, the happiness and well-being factor was much higher. Anyway, um, I could go on and on and on. I'm pretty good at keeping to the time, you know. We all in the academic world, as you know, come from the Fidel Castro School of Public Speaking, so I could go on and on. But I'll just stop there, and, and I, I very much welcome, I welcome your questions. And thank you for your patience in, in sitting and listening. Well, thank you. Thank you. How much of this is culturally generalized? We have two sets of data. The economic data is worldwide. The cultural data is highly American and Western-centric. Um, we now have a research team that spans most of Europe, Northern Europe, with sprinklings in Asia, very few in Latin America, none in Africa. My goal in the Institute is to make it more culturally generalizable. But to this point, our work has, in the cultural and psychological piece, a Western bias. I could, and if we follow up, I said my email was florida at creativeclass.com, I could ask my research team to think about whether we have any data on people who came from other cultures and happen to be located in North America, my fear, just to be honest with you, is that those are not adequate representations of the phenomena you want. We have to go out and collect deeper samples in those cultures and constructs. I ask this because I just spent a year in India, and the things you're talking about are you know, completely orthogonal to my experience in India. They just they don't apply, almost as if you were speaking a different language. Now, I'm from yeah. the US. I hear you. And I, think, and I think, where were you in India? in Bangalore. Yeah. And that's very interesting to me um, because Bangalore is a spike and if we find cultural differences or cultural conflict there then we found something interesting but but that's one of the things that the goal of our new institute is to make these more culturally generalizable and actually to be quite candid the other reason we wanted to move outside not, not that Toronto's all that far but by moving to Toronto I felt I really felt what you you see that much of this work is American centric and the need to bring a greater, uh, greater global perspective. And hopefully in the future, we'll be able to do more of that. 
This work, to be quite candid, ha shares that bias. Oh God, I don't. I'm, I'll try to. Do you have an idea of maybe tracking or qualifying something that is a domain-specific network effect, where you kind of just have to be in a certain place? Yes. Or like Silicon Valley is known for the tech startups. You can really not do a deal if you're too far away from from Wall Street. Yes. Like this is not just because people want to live here. You kind of have to live here. That, yeah, and I think that's that's the point of the work. We're going to dig deeper into that. But this domain-specific network and the domain-specific networks are not that much overlapping. They are geographically specific. The Silicon Valley tech network, the New York City or London investment banking network, the Nashville is the same thing for for music deals. And Jack White, I didn't get this interview but it came out after the book, he said, the reason I moved to Nashville, and I don't have this in the book, is he had Detroit had a debilitating scene and people were kind of mean, but he said, I want to write hits. That's what he said. He said, I want to write hits, and in Nashville, all the people who know how to write hits and make hits live in Nashville. I think this domain-specific network is becoming much more geographically distinct across many fields. And you had your hand up. Yeah, I mean, my question is related to yours. Um, and I was just wondering if that is a case of people moving to places that are already established hubs, yes. then how does one create new hubs? Like would you would you do any like would you do any research into like how these kind of cities are built up? Let me tell you, when I asked Jane Jacobs this question, and she's such a wonderfully brilliant woman, here's what she said to me. When a place gets boring, even the rich people leave. <laughs> Think about that. I mean, it was the most incredible remark that there are these Gladwellian tipping points. You don't know when they're going to occur. But all of a sudden, a place that was exciting and filled with energy and filled with, you know, all of a sudden it just gets boring. And, the, and she said to me, she said, Richard, look at some of the greatest neighborhoods in the world that are now slums. They, they were the greatest neighborhoods, they're now slums. At some point, they were one of these networks. And then it was all lost. So, so I think at certain points, these networks either become rigid uh, they become sclerotic, or maybe an entrepreneurial act occurs in a new area. You know, maybe Waterloo is one now. I'm just brainstorming with you. Maybe we're seeing the birth of one in Waterloo. The one we track historically is Nashville. Nashville was a backwater in, now they had some country players, but it was not a music hub in 1950, and you can watch it grow. So the question is what ignites it, and, and what we believe is that they're kind of random acts. Mm -hmm. It's not Stanford that ignited the valley. There were lots of possible Stanfords. There was some ign ignited act, igniting act that allowed that to take off. And then they developed some advantage for some period of time if they're nurtured. But the other one is, look, we just came back from Dayton. Dayton was a tremendous center of domain-specific knowledge in bicycling and then car and then planes. Ron is from Detroit. I mean, you're talking about one of the greatest agglomerations of tech Pittsburgh. I mean, Pittsburgh was kind of a Silicon Valley of its day. So we kind of have a sense of why they decline when they get rigid. We believe they're kind of random acts. And, and I talk about this in the book. I say, I talk about the joke. Uh, they asked one venture capitalist in the Valley, how do you create another Silicon Valley? They said, he said, um, take one great university, add venture capital, you know, and, and add a little sunshine. It's not that simple. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and there really are. Um, I, 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 would, I would hunch that it's places that start to collect these kind of highly open, highly innovative people, and at some point they, they reach an ignition point. But that's a question for, that needs a lot more study. I'll go to this side of the room, and then we'll, I'll try to get as many, and I'll keep my answer short. So you mentioned that you surveyed people about their happiness and factors that would make them more or less happy and, and what factors affect their happiness. And when I hear about these surveys, I always wonder how it is that you can rely on people to know these things. That's a great question. Did you take economics at Princeton? No. <laughs> Princeton has the greatest group of people in happiness studies <laughs> in the world. Danny Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for his, his theory. And he actually was a consultant, not to me, but consultant to Gallup on these surveys. You try to ask the best and most precise questions you can. But people will tell you if you want, to, want the most precise answers, and they're very hard to do, and Kahneman has done them, you have to track diaries that people keep every day and regularly during the day. And oftentimes, if you do that, if you do that, you will see that reported happiness, you know what I'm saying, if they, on a survey, may differ. We, we hope and we believe that the data are as accurate, and we ask the toughest and best questions we could have. But there are all kinds of problems of subjective bias. But the patterns are empirically robust, so they're suggestive. They're suggestive. I don't want to say this is the last word. They're suggestive of an effect. And I think the most important thing in this survey 
I'm a smart enough social scientist to know how these things can be so calibrated. The most important thing in this survey says is that place is important. I mean, if you calibrate it that way, it says that place is this thing we've not talked about. It's important as a third leg. And then I think to dig into that, we're going to have to do more calibrated surveys. Okay, I actually have two questions. Please. Um, so the fir first is, like, I think we, most of us in this room could probably, um, would probably agree with, like, the fact that New York is awesome. And, like, if you're Eugene Jacobs, you understand, like, why it's awesome. It's you know, so it yeah. goes in a lot of detail. And like other places, it's hard to find other cities in the New York that has, other than New York, that have that kind of quality. Yep. Uh, and yet, New York isn't, and we, I think we intuitively feel that New York is very good for the creative class, except uh, demographically, New York isn't really growing. In fact, it, in, according to some surveys, it's actually right. shrinking. Uh, so, and what's up with that? Well, there's two things. I mean, this is a very, in, in nor is London, or, or nor is the Valley, nor is San Francisco. And, and so some of my critics, who are very smart people, say, well, Florida has it wrong because if you look at big globs of employment growth or big globs of population growth, they're not in New York. They're in sunny, sprawling suburban areas. And, and, and what's really happening, and I talk about this in the book, I, I call the chapter, I think it's where the brains are, is you're having a very different kind of migration. You're having a migration of highly skilled, highly educated people with high incomes to the, to the New Yorks and San Francisco's of the world. And in a sense, because our household sizes are smaller, most of us in this room are in one or two person households. When we move to a city, we might just be displacing a four, five, six, seven, eight person household. And we're consuming, even though our apartments are small, we're consuming more space. So what's happening is wealthier people are moving into these areas. The, the population is a sort, it's not a shift. And they're displacing much larger numbers of lower income, lower skilled people. And, and that's the way you have to look at it. And we, we looked at actually the IRS data, the tax data. It is, ter it is terrifying, this kind of sorting process. The other thing that's really terrifying is how unequal these places are becoming. I mean, you have the relatively affluent and the super affluent, and you have people who are just completely at the other end of the spectrum. So in a sense, it's not only that cross-regionally we're spiky. We're very spiky and even within these places. Please, I see your hand up. Is, is benefit going to Yes. The, the yes. That yes. That's why she said. If you get a monoculture in New York, she saw it. I mean, she said to me, you already got it. She said, when a place gets boring, I see her hand. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Why don't you jump in? Yes. Let's do it. Oh, man, let's do it. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Oh my God. <laughs> this is such an interesting, because you know, we, I think I even wrote about in this book, I wrote on my blog about in the Valley, the bus, and how a lot of my critics said, oh no, 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 all the gay and artsy people live in San Francisco, all the techies, you know, you guys are disproof that techie people don't like this kind of neighborhood. But it, 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 it's, it's like, okay, Rich, you got it completely wrong. All that want are these conservative, and that, that's their words, not more. Conservative engineers who want to live in a ranch house, and then all the crazy people, your people, the crazy people, live in San Francisco. Well, the bus to me was just to disprove. I think you've identified a great research project, and I don't know if we could do it together. I don't know if the data is available. But simply to plot the neighborhood locations in, in this location and on the west coast of the Google people would be, I think, a quite remarkable project. We really want to get to these neighborhood effects. You almost need company data or you need somebody who really knows how to distill census data. But, but we believe that it's not just people moving to New York or just people moving to San they're, they're living in specific neighborhoods. The book tries to name some of these and we, we came up with these funny names like the Hipster Haven or the Urban Mosaic or like the New York, like parts of New York turning into the Strollerville. You know, <laughs> we, we tried to create a typology. No data for that. But, but, but we believe that the, the data, if it's we could... It's not just about the job that you're locally near, it's about people Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, and, incre and if they don't, they're not, they maybe are a similar income group, but they don't necessarily are a similar uh, ethnic or racial makeup or, or, or a similar career pattern, but similar income group. Did you have a question? Oh, man. <laughs> another, another financial firm, I asked them this question. I was asked to address their partners. I, I use this quote in the book. They said, oh, Richard, we're not the effect of the real estate bubble. We're the cause. I mean, that's what the guy, 
No, another financial firm. We're the cause. I mean, it's our people bidding up the price of real estate. I think there's two answers to that question. One, New York is mistakenly seen as a financial center. It's not. We look at the 50 location quotients that are the top location quotients in New York. Four, three to four of them were in the financial markets. The rest of them were things in entertainment, design, all of the quote unquote core creative fields. And then there were three other ones. And I, I call them kind of the support occupations of the creative age. It was like entertainment lawyer, <laughs> podiatrist, and personal coach. I'm not kidding you. Uh, and so there were six out of 50 that were either financial, six or seven out of 50 were financial or other, 43 or 44 that were kind of creative. So I think New York isn't, it is, has been a conglomeration of the financial industry. The thing is, I'm not sure prices will come down here. And the reason is this market is global. It's not a local market. So you're competing for property in New York City with a bunch of rich people from the, around the world. That said, I think if it comes down at all, it'll be one of the best investments you can ever make. Um, I'm interested to know if you know of any research that's being done on creativity in slum areas or lower income communities, because I feel like coping mechanisms promote innovation in a very different way than the way we perceive the creative class. Yeah. That's the last question. Okay. Um, this will be the last question. I can take questions offline. Rip Florida at creativeclass.com. What about creativity in low income slum neighborhoods? I didn't talk about rise of the creative class, but there's some misinterpretation of that book. Here's the core of my theory. Every single human being is creative. And actually, one of the companies I use as my examples of a creative company is not just Google, it's Toyota. And, and when I use Toyota as an example, it's because it saw the factory workers as the key source of, te of technological and, and continuous innovation, not just the engineers and the folks in the product development lab. What that book really argues, and my subsequent work has argued, and this book talks about a little, but this book's about, about finding your place, is that really the key to building a more prosperous society has to be unleashing that creativity and using it in economically the most productive ends. So no longer having this divide between those of us who have the fortune and, and good luck and perseverance to use our skills, but to make, and, and I'll tell you guys, growing up working class in New Jersey, this all end, the smartest people I ever met were there. They were in the working class, tough neighborhoods, and, and all, 99% of those kids were left behind. So I resonate with that. There's a growing literature, and we hope our answer. It's been great to be with you guys. Thanks for your questions, and I'll be happy to hang around and take a few more offline. Thank you.